what are you doing now? Um, overclocking, um, extreme overclocking, using dry ice, liquid nitrogen, and pushing some very cool performance out of the components here. Okay, that's pretty cool. What what sort of platform are you on? Intel? I'm um, on running Intel Sandy Bridge, so it's the 1155 platform, um, running at 2600K. Um, the stock is 3.4 gigahertz, I'm currently sitting at 5.6. Um, and I'm using dry ice to cool that, so that's sitting at 67 degrees, minus 67. Then I'm also running a GTX 580 here. Um, also overclocked quite hectically. Uh, that's the stock is around about 700. It's sitting at 1300 at the moment, um, and that's sitting at minus 182 at the moment. Okay, sweet. Um, run us quickly uh, through quickly. Uh, why are you using dry ice on the CPU and LN2 on the graphics card? Basically, the thing is with uh, Sandy Bridge, you don't need to go extremely cold. Well, not colder than really, say minus 65, to get the best performance out of it. So. LN2 is more expensive, so it's kind of a way to use LN2 when you don't need to really. Right. Um, we're on the graphics card, do you need the cold? Uh, no cold boot issues that you've experienced throughout Nothing the day? Nothing yet, no. Okay, can you, can you explain to us what a cold boot issue is, just, just in a few words? Um, cold boot is really if the system's off and you try and boot, it's too cold, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Won't so it's work, too yeah. cold and it doesn't work. But too cold, it won't work. Once it's running, you can go colder generally. That's okay. why it's called boot, it's only on boot. But uh, yeah, from the boot it won't work. You have to actually get up and running and then you can drop the temperatures. Okay, cool. Who, who's supporting you here? Who, who are you benching for? Um, obviously we're at the ASUS stand. Right. So we're using ASUS hardware, motherboard and graphics card. Then we also have Kingston on board. Um, they letting us use their nice uh, new SSDs uh, as well as RAM. Right, okay. And. Um do you, have the, do you have the sort of equipment to compete on an international stage? Yes, we do to an extent. Um, with certain things we can, with certain things we can't. So it is a bit of a, you know, we'd have to know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, with most things we can, but some of the really extreme records and that we don't even bother going after because it's just, you know, we don't have anything to oh. even start to look at those. And what's it like benching at a live event? Is it a little bit harder than sitting there at home? Um, it is a bit job? harder. Uh, mainly though because you have a lot of people coming up and you know you're in the middle of a run you're trying to watch your temperatures and keep things stable and people are asking you questions at the same time which makes it a bit interesting but other than that it's not too much difference and are you hoping public benching things like this will uh, get people interested in overclocking expand oh, the definitely. South African community definitely I mean yeah the South African community is really small at the moment um, there's maybe four or five of us that bench on a frequent basis other than that you know for the whole South Africa that's very small um, we would like to kind of extend that and grow the whole community quite solidly. Um, but yeah. Why, why is the community so small? Is it the cost barrier? Is it intimidating? Cost, sourcing liquid nitrogen and dry ice um, and just the general know-how. Um, I mean, the nice thing in Joburg is, you know, there's a few of us here in Joburg. We have a team and we can help people that want to learn. But in your more remote areas, they can't source liquid nitrogen. They can't source dry ice. The, you know, for learning, we can only help them online, but you can only help them so much, you know, where someone standing next to you is far more helpful. Okay, is there any such thing as a professional overclocker? Is this something yes. you can turn into a career or...? Um, okay, when you say it like that, yes and no. Um, there's no real overclockers that actually do it as their only income. Um, that's not sustainable, but there are a lot that do things around overclocking, you know, as an income. So making the pots for the CPUs, for example. Um, there's a guy called Kingpin. He makes pots for GPUs, graphics cards, and also sources several other suppliers for overclocking. And he does that and his sponsorships, and so he's fully sponsored. You know, between those two, he can live. Um, but there is very few that can do that. Uh, most, most of your sort of professional overclockers have their job and then they get sponsored. So it's kind of a balance between the two. Awesome, one last question. Yeah. Most fun uh, part of overclocking? Um, finishing a really good score. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for chatting to us. Cool, no problems. Bye.